I really do not think that Capcom and Naughty Dog realize just how topical their 2020 releases of Resident Evil 3 and The Last of Us Part 2, respectively, would turn out to be. Both games were released in the spring and summer, as a strange novel coronavirus, believed to have jumped from Chinese bats to people, began to spread within the United States and the rest of the world. Both games are about zombie apocalypses, and were released at a time in which large portions of the global economy had been shut down, and residents were expected to essentially shelter in place in their homes for weeks or months to prevent the spread of the pandemic. The 2020 pandemic, which is still ongoing more than 18 months later, despite the widespread availability of multiple vaccines, provided me with some unexpected context on these two games. Both games are zombie apocalypse games, and zombie fiction is often based around fears and anxieties of social collapse in one form or another. The original Night of the Living Dead channeled the anxieties of nuclear Armageddon and mutually assured destruction, and filtered them through the lens of both McCarthy-era communist witch hunts and a degree of racial tension. George Romero's Dawn of the Dead channeled fears that consumerist culture would lead to toxic behavior that is not only self-destructive to the individual, but also to society at large. And gee, aren't we all glad that that hasn't happened yet? Zombies in other fiction might represent anxieties about racism, sexism, socialism, technology gone amok, and so forth. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the metaphors of zombie fictions in pop media. Uh, If you want to know more about it, Lindsay Ellis has an excellent video on her channel, so check that out. Video game zombies are no different, and they can represent any of those anxieties from a simple narrative standpoint. But, because games are an interactive experience, zombie games can even explore anxieties about a loss of individual autonomy in ways that non-interactive media would struggle to approach. But I'm not here right now to talk about zombie games in general. I want to talk specifically about the pair of blockbuster zombie games that released last year during the height of a real-life pandemic. Both Last of Us games express concerns about the increasingly myopic us-and-them mentality in American culture and politics, and the apparent inability of many people to empathize with others and see their point of view, or in some cases, even their humanity. And Resident Evil, as a series, has always channeled anxieties about the self-destructive nature of the corporate desire to make profit at all costs, and then use their vast wealth and lobbying power to cover up their unethical activities. Regardless of the messages intended by the developers, playing both of these games in 2020 made it really hard for me to not look at them both through the lenses of my own anxieties about the contemporary pandemic situation that we all saw ourselves in and continue to see ourselves in 18 months later. It was a situation that neither game's developers could have possibly foreseen, even even though scientists, public health experts, and futurists have been sounding the alarm bells for the inevitability of pandemics in our increasingly globalized world for years or decades now. Anyway, since neither Capcom nor Naughty Dog could foresee that the games would launch in the middle of a real-world pandemic of this scope, they didn't really design their games around the ideas and anxieties of a real-life pandemic. And I think that, having been through a real-life pandemic now, That shows clearly in both games. After all, it would be so much easier to deal with a pandemic if we could clearly see the spread of the disease in the way that characters in Resident Evil and The Last of Us can see it. It would be so easy to isolate and quarantine individuals if infection causes their skin to almost immediately start rotting, or if we could see with our naked eye the little coronaviruses coming out of people's mouths and noses when they cough, sneeze, or breathe. And it would be so much easier if the disease itself were only transmitted between people through invasive physical contacts such as a bite. But unfortunately for the whole world, none of that is true in the real-life COVID pandemic. In light of a real-world pandemic, it seems almost silly that the fictional pandemics of Resident Evil and The Last of Us could possibly lead to such widespread societal collapse, and the pandemic itself is actually of little concern to the player. Like, seriously, it's creating literal zombies. How was this not nipped in the bud immediately? (sighs) To be clear, what follows represents my own personal contextualization for playing Resident Evil 3 and The Last of Us Part 2 during the COVID pandemic, 
These impressions do not represent my opinions on the actual quality of the games on their own merits. You can check out my reviews of both games on my personal blog at www.megabearsfan.net if you're interested, or check out my video on the lessons Capcom learned for Resident Evil 3, which I posted shortly after the game's release last year. So don't go jumping onto the comments, putting words in my mouth and saying that I don't know what I'm talking about for hating these games for not being whatever it is that I wanted them to be. I don't hate them. I understand that they aren't about the pandemic. All I'm saying is that having played them during a pandemic made it much more obvious that neither game is about a pandemic, despite both games being set during pandemics. In the Resident Evil games, there is never any fear of becoming infected. As a matter of gameplay contrivance, the player character can be bit by zombies and heal the wound and cure the infection without any long-term effects. This is true even though the game's own rules clearly establish that being bit turns a person into a zombie. It happens to NPCs. The zombies are thus less like genuine sick people who might spread a deadly disease to you, and more like just dangerous or rabid animals that might hurt or kill you. The disease element is minimized to the point of triviality. It's not even like being bitten puts you under a time limit to use a curing item before the character succumbs to the disease. There's no moment of panic, oh my god, I'm infected, unless it happens as part of a cutscene, in which case it will probably be resolved as part of the completion of a miss mission objective or of the entire story itself. It's not like the poison status effect of many RPGs that gradually depletes the character's health until you die and which must be cured by using a special poison remedy or antidote. Nope. Attacks from zombies just take away hit points, which you can heal at any point in the future, so long as you don't take enough hits to reduce your hit points to zero. It's no different than being shot or stabbed or hit with blunt force. There was in fact one Resident Evil side game that experimented with this sort of thing. I did not play Resident Evil Outbreak because that game was designed around multiplayer co-op, but I never had a network adapter for the PS2, nor did I have anyone to play the games with, so I never played them and don't have any first-hand experience of how this particular feature worked. Supposedly, Outbreak has a separate meter for health and a virus gauge. Taking damage from enemies would reduce your health, which you could heal with Resident Evil's trademark herbs and first aid spray, but each bite from a zombie would also cumulatively increase your virus gauge percentage. If your virus percentage ever gets all the way up to 100%, you become a zombie and can even attack the other players or be put down by them. I presume that if one player succumbs to infection, the other players would have to go on without that player and are still capable of beating the scenario. As far as I know, this mechanic was never carried over into any of the other single-player Resident Evil games or the co-op ones, uh, like Resident Evil 5 or 6. Being a multiplayer game built around shorter scenarios instead of a full-length campaign, Outbreak was a lot more free to experiment with interesting new ideas like this, even if other elements of that experimentation may have failed miserably. So, Outbreak remains an experimental anomaly in the Resident Evil series, the mainline games could have a similar infection meter, especially in the hardcore or new game plus modes that many of them offer. If you get infected and can't cure it before turning, then it would be game over. Hope you have a save from before you got bit. The Last of Us has been criticized for being yet another zombie apocalypse game. Of course, defensive fans of The Last of Us, and there are so many of them, would be quick to point out that they're not zombies, they're infected, referring to the fact that the zombies of The Last of Us are infected and transformed by fungal spores, and not, like, the T-virus. I don't know what the heck they're expecting. Of course, it doesn't help their case that the cordyceps fungus is often referred to as a zombie disease in real life because of what it does to insects in real life. Nor does it help that the primary vector of infection in the game seems to be from bites from the fungus-infected zombies. So, yeah, it's a zombie game, for all practical intents and purposes. And it has all the same problems that I just mentioned about Resident Evil. The one thing that separates The Last of Us's zombies from the more traditional zombies of a game like Resident Evil is the fact that the infection can also be transmitted by spores that are emitted by the ripened carcasses of the infected. 
but Naughty Dog has yet to really implement any real compelling gameplay mechanics associated with exposure to these spores. Spores are clearly visible, floating around in the air, and approaching them causes the characters to simply put on their handy gas masks automatically with no input from the user and then proceed as if nothing were wrong. The spores in these particular set pieces at worst limit the player's visibility, which is usually not that big of a deal because these characters all have x-ray detective vision anyway. This is, of course, in stark contrast to real life, in which fungal spores are microscopic and not visible to the human eye. If cordyceps were to suddenly jump from insects to humans, which is exceedingly unlikely, then by the time you notice a corpse emitting spores, you will have already inhaled them and infected yourself. In the case of COVID-19, if we could all see the little tiny coronaviruses coming out of people's mouths and would know that they're infected, we could just put on our face masks to protect ourselves and then maintain social distance from that person would be a whole lot easier to do. The Last of Us 2 actually has a set piece in which the player must explore a spore-riddled environment in order to find a gas mask for the NPC companion character. During this time, you temporarily lose access to that NPC as a damage sponge and as a DPS dealer, and you have to go it alone. Even when you find the gas mask, you just pull it off a dead body, which probably contaminates the inside of the mask with spores, yet the characters don't need to disinfect the mask or anything before putting it on. Again, the threat of the spores and of the contagion is completely trivial. But this little set piece does at least pose an interesting possibility for expanding the game. Perhaps The Last of Us could have made masks or mask filters be an item that has durability, like the silencers in the game. The player can't enter an area with spores without wearing a mask, and they would have to leave the range of the spores before the mask or filter deteriorates, or it's game over. The game could then be full of optional areas containing spores that could contain valuable items, upgrades, or maybe even some little story bits. If there's ever a required path that has spores, the game would probably have to provide a fresh mask to the player, but the deteriorating filter would put a time pressure on the player to complete that level before the filter expires. This could force more reckless behavior, which could lead to interesting gameplay scenarios, and it would limit the ability to just, you know, freely explore for extra loot. Naughty Dog could also solve that problem by offering branching paths through the main areas, where one path might have very dangerous armed human enemies, and the other path might be safer, but is infected with spores and requires a mask to proceed. Players who use their mask resources judiciously would thus have easier or shorter paths through the game in which they avoid those more dangerous human opponents with machine guns. Either approach would expose the player to the risk of infection, which would make the spores and that risk of infection much more relevant to the broader gameplay and strategy. And by more relevant, I mean relevant at all. A big part of what makes a real-life pandemic so scary is the difficulty in determining who is actually infected and whether or not any given activity is riskier than it's worth, no matter how simple or mundane that activity might actually be. Anybody could be infected, and in the worst cases, any contact or proximity to an infected person might spread the infection to you, and then you bring it back to your family. Things that we do every day, like going to work or picking up milk and eggs at the grocery store, suddenly become filled with risk and even mortal dread. And real-life pandemics are emotionally exhausting for human beings. We are, by nature, social animals, but that social lifestyle is exactly what allows diseases to spread. In order to fight the spread of disease, we need to go against our own nature and socially isolate ourselves. This can lead to emotional stress from being pent up and alone, and also creates social anxieties. Who do you trust? How far do you go to isolate yourself from the rest of the population? And how do you decide who you should and should not have close contact with? None of this sort of thing is represented in these big-budget video games which were set during pandemics. Because the signs of infection are so obvious in Resident Evil and The Last of Us, and the vector of transmission is the bite of a rabid zombie, neither game really addresses this social isolation, distrust, or anxiety that comes about during actual pandemics. 
characters in both games are perfectly willing to trust and team up with other characters they meet uh, without ever having any fear of whether they might be exposing themselves to infection. Because if those other characters would be infected, it would be obvious. Even when the other characters do inevitably become infected, because they always do in these games, they can always immediately be isolated or euthanized before the infection can be spread to the other main characters. Any distrust between characters is more of a personal or ideological thing, rather than being a pragmatic concern about not wanting to get sick, which again does not reflect reality. Again, this isn't a factor in either Resident Evil or The Last of Us at all, because characters know if they've been infected. There is virtually no risk of a good-faith actor unwittingly transmitting the disease to other trusted people. The only way that this disease spreads within a community is if members of the community lie and conceal their infected nature and act in bad faith. Well, hmm, I don't know, maybe it is more realistic than I thought. Whatever. Anyway, sure, society is collapsing just outside the perspective of our player avatars, but the disease itself never seems to be a genuine threat to those avatars or to the players playing the game. And before I go, I want to contrast this with some other AAA games that released prior to 2020 that may have actually done a better job of representing a re more realistic pandemic situation. Both of these games, interestingly enough, were directed by Hideo Kojima, one of video games' few genuine auteur authors. Heck, maybe the only one. The first game is Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, and there will be some major story spoilers for that game incoming, so skip ahead to the timecode shown on the screen if you want to avoid major story spoilers for MGS5. During the course of MGS5, the player can recruit enemy soldiers into Boss's private army. And of course, by recruit, I mean kidnap, but uh, whatever, semantics. These recruited soldiers can be sent on automated operations to recover resources that can be used to upgrade Mother Base or to develop new equipment for Boss to use in missions. The player can even take personal control of an individual recruited soldier and play certain side missions. These soldiers become a valuable asset to the player, and by playing as some of the characters, the player might even develop a little bit of an attachment to some of them. This comes to a head in Chapter 2 of MGS5, at which point the vocal cord parasite, which was introduced in the first chapter, begins to spread throughout Mother Base, infecting those same soldiers you spent the entire first half of the game recruiting. Since these soldiers have proven useful to Boss and the player, their sudden death is felt by the player, and there's little you can do about it other than proceed with story missions to try to develop a cure. There's even a mission in which you are required to execute, or maybe euthanize would be a more appropriate word, infected soldiers in order to prevent the infection from spreading to other parts of Mother Base. And with the death toll steadily rising as you dally and do side content, there is an actual pressure on the player to solve the problem before Mother Base becomes a ghost town. This is the rare example of a big-budget open-world game that actually creates a sense of urgency in order to progress the main narrative or a specific quest. Yeah, sure, Boss is never at risk of contracting the vocal cord parasite, so it's not a concern to the player in that way, but it can completely wipe out the entire population of Mother Base if it is left unchecked so it at least does create that sense of tension and that sense of urgency for the player. This is, in my opinion, the single best idea that Metal Gear Solid V has, and it's a damn shame that it was hidden inside the awful, grindy, and repetitive second chapter, and also that it just ends so soon and peters out with very little actual payoff. Ugh. God, the second chapter of MGS5 is so awful. <sighs> so much wasted potential. And then there's Death Stranding. Yes, I'm going to bring up Death Stranding yet <laughs> again. Um, as I've said before, it's amazing how prophetic Kojima's games are, whether it's Metal Gear Solid 2 predicting a future of Orwellian information manipulation, or Death Stranding portraying human communities in apocalyptic isolation and lockdown. Death Stranding doesn't deal with a actual pandemic per se, but it does predict a future in which natural catastrophe decimates the human population 
and forces the survivors into isolated communities spread out across the country and presumably the world. And while people aren't getting sick, the risk of a void out from a person dying leads to health care and death care being a paramount importance to society. It works very well as a metaphor for a pandemic, even though it's not actually a literal pandemic in the game. Just like a single infected individual or corpses, depending on the disease, can spread infectious disease to healthy and living individuals in close contact with the infected or the corpse, a dead body triggering a void out will kill any body caught in the blast radius. What's more important, and what separates Death Stranding from Resident Evil and The Last of Us, is that there is also a ludic consequence to the player for failing to take precautions against the metaphoric pandemic. If the player dies, it can cause a void out, which will permanently scar the map. If you kill a mule, it will similarly cause a void out, which can kill you or give you a game over. Human life in Death Stranding is at a premium. Unlike in The Last of Us, in which Joel, Ellie, and Abby go around mass murdering large portions of what little remains of the human gene pool. So, what do you think? How did you feel when playing these post apocalyptic pandemic games during the lockdown period of a real life pandemic? Did they hit a bit too close to home, especially considering that games like these are usually consumed as escapist fantasy? Wasn't the thematic message of The Last of Us Part II in particular already dour and heavy-hitting enough without also constantly reminding us of all the death, suffering, and anxiety that was happening in the real world all around us? Or were you able to successfully compartmentalize it all? In any case, the COVID pandemic is still unfortunately ongoing. People are still getting sick. People are still dying. More Americans are now dead of COVID or COVID-related complications than the number of Americans who died in every foreign war this country has ever fought combined. That means COVID has now killed more Americans in less than 18 months than it took the likes of Hitler, the Viet Cong, Saddam Hussein, and the Taliban decades of cumulative conflict to achieve. And we're still counting. Don't become part of that statistic. Please act responsibly, stay safe, and stay healthy. Vaccines are readily available and free in most cases, so please get one if you haven't already, and consider getting a booster if they are approved and recommended. Also, please continue to wear your masks in public places, even if you are already vaccinated. Anyway, thanks for watching. And remember that you can support the creation of further content like this by contributing via Patreon. I'll be providing a link in the description.